Welcome to my talk, A Gout Hypothesis and a Plan for Remission. Hi, my name is Dr. Pete Delanoy, and I'm a PhD biochemist, nutrition network advisor, and a low-carb specialist in the reversal of chronic disease. In 2016, I was diagnosed with gout, and then in 2019, I was diagnosed with prediabetes. I reversed the prediabetes in 52 days utilizing the ketogenic diet, and my gout is in remission. My talk focuses on a comprehensive model of gout and how we can use that information to put gout in remission, and we are starting right now. It is said that gout is the disease of kings and the disease of the rich. It wasn't until the industrial age when wealth was more distributed, where we had the emergence of the middle class, where the common man could afford alcohol and sugar. And along with the alcohol and the sugar and the pastries and the breads came a rise in gout. Let's look at some statistics. A full 4% of the U.S. population suffers from gout. Extraordinarily, there's at least 43 million people that are hyperuricemic. That means that they're walking around with high uric acid, but they are asymptomatic for gout. We also see that if you suffer from gout, the mean uric acid is 8.3 mg per deciliter. Now, the importance of this number is for the viewer to understand that the reference range that the doctor uses to determine whether or not your uric acid is normal is between four and eight mg per deciliter. So I want to make sure you, you understand that the mean uric acid is 8.3 mg per deciliter, which is literally at the top of the normal reference range. It's not above it. Next, a full 18% of gout sufferers have uh, uric acid concentrations between 6 to 8 mg per deciliter. So they actually are in the normal reference range for uric acid. And then literally 14% have uric acid concentrations that are under 6 mg per deciliter. So it's actually relatively common for somebody to have a gout flare whose uric acid is considered normal. And then lastly, when you aspirate the joints of, a, of many different people and look for the presence of uric acid crystals or more correctly, urate, sodium urate crystals, crystals can be found in the joints of normal people that are not suffering from gout. The take home message of the statistics is that uric acid is indeed required for a gout flare. However, Uric acid alone is not sufficient to cause a gout flare. There has to be other factors involved. More often than not, if you're a gout sufferer and you go to the doctor, the condition is gonna be treated like you have a headache. In other words, like it's an isolated type of injury and it can be treated by being given an anti-inflammatory. And everyone here needs to understand that if the doctor asks the gout sufferer to rate their pain on a scale of one to 10, the gout sufferer is gonna come back with 10 because it is a debilitating, highly painful event. But the question is, is gout an isolated, individualized type of disease? And the answer is no. When you look at this slide, you can see that there is a variety of chronic conditions that are associated with gout. Chronic kidney disease, obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, high blood pressure. When you compare the column, the hyperuricemia column, to the gout column, you can see that this looks like a stepping stair, that we're moving from one set of conditions that are less severe to the same set of conditions which are more severe. And those of us in the movement to reverse chronic disease recognize that this constellation of conditions is, is probably being driven 
by a central driving force. So the central driving force is most likely insulin resistance. And this is characterized by a set of conditions such as high triglycerides, low HDL, high blood pressure, a high fasting glucose, oftentimes with a high A1C, a high waist to height circumference, and I'm adding high uric acid to the list. So what does a working hypothesis of gout look like? Number one, we need the presence of uric acid. We know that we need sodium urate crystallized in the joint. We also understand that on its own, the crystallization of the uric acid is not enough. Secondly, we need an inflammatory cascade with the expression of a transcription factor called junk one. And junk one seems to be at the pinnacle of the inflammation cascade. Lastly, we need formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome with the urate crystals in order to have a gout flare. The origin of the gout hypothesis comes directly from the work of Dr. Richard Johnson, who has spent a few decades looking at the role of fructose and the production of uric acid as the main driving force for metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. Also for this talk, I drew on the writings of Dr. Robert Lustig, who has done a brilliant job in bringing together the effects of multiple calories of different substances all descending on the liver at the same time. Predominantly alcohol, fructose, and glucose, all from a single meal arriving on the, the liver at the same time. And uniformly driving the conditions and the characteristics of metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. At the center of Johnson's work and reviewed by Lustig is the idea that uric acid is, is one of the central players in driving kidney dysfunction, systemic inflammation with the, with the stimulation or the activation of junk one, mitochondrial dysfunction, fatty liver, insulin resistance, because of the mitochondrial dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction because of the interruption of nitric oxide, metabolic syndrome, and then finally, the gout condition. On the slide, I have listed three substances that are involved in the production of uric acid and one activity that also produces uric acid. Now in this talk, we are going to prioritize the uric acid producing mechanisms based on a definition. And that definition is we're going to be looking at substances that cause a sudden acute rise of uric acid within the cell. So we're going to mainly be focused on the alcohol and the fructose. We are going to talk about the protein, but there is a difference in how the protein is metabolized by comparison to the alcohol and the fructose. And while the protein indeed produces uric acid when it's metabolized, it's not producing a sudden acute rise on an intracellular basis of uric acid. And then lastly, we have exercise. And depending on the type of exercise you're doing, uric acid can indeed be elevated. So what, whatever the case is as we go through the talk, the, both the protein component and the exercise component are going to contribute in a secondary way to the rise in uric acid caused by the metabolism of alcohol and fructose. Now let's talk about what the sources are of alcohol and fructose. I think the source of alcohol is pretty much a no-brainer. Beer, wine, spirits, etc. However, the fruct fructose, that may well be unknown to some people in the audience. And its source 
is sugar, high fructose corn syrups, agave syrups, and processed food. Let's take a minute and talk about each one of these. In terms of sugar, fructose is present 50% by mass. And the fructose and the glucose that's in the cane sugar is bonded together by a covalent bond. In the case of high fructose corn syrup, we're talking about a mixture. And this is different from cane sugar because the fructose and the glucose are not bonded by a covalent bond. It is a mixture. And the mixture is not equal. Usually in high fructose corn syrup, the fructose component is present at concentrations greater than 55% fructose. Next, we have the agave syrups. And in particular, these are really bad because the fructose component is usually present at 80% or more. And then we have processed food. And there's basically not anything that you can pick off of the shelf in a package, a box, or a bottle in the supermarket that doesn't have sugar or high fructose corn syrup or agave syrups that are in it. For the purpose of our talk, you can see on the slide that I've made an equivalency between fructose and alcohol. And this is because even though they are uh, metabolized by different pathways, the pathways are parallel and the outcome is the same with the sudden rise, acute rise of uric acid on an intracellular basis. I have the fructose and the alcohol equivalent for that reason and the effect is greater than the effect of protein. So to lay the groundwork for the source of the uric acid, the sudden acute rise within the cell and then subsequent to that, the sudden acute rise in the circulating uric acid, what I want to do on this slide is draw your, your attention to what I think is a good example of a standard American meal. So picture this guy who goes into a pizzeria. He sits down and he orders a couple of beers, a large sausage pizza, and maybe some breadsticks on the side, and then a loaded salad. Let's take the beer first. First and foremost, it's got alcohol in it. So we have that com component. Let's just set it to the side for the second. Then what about glucose or fructose? So in terms of glucose, the beer has maltose in it, which is glucose. So now we have two macromolecules that are going to be processed at essentially the same time when they reach the liver. We have the alcohol and we have the glucose. The question is, can there be fructose in beer? And the answer is, we really don't know for sure. Here is a court case between Miller Coors and Anheuser-Busch in 2019. The dispute is over whether or not there is high fructose corn syrup in Miller Coors beer. It was an advertising campaign that Anheuser-Busch uh, produced a commercial during the Super Bowl. And this is what the dispute is, that Anheuser-Busch um, is doing false advertising. The one thing that you can find, though, if you read the court document, is that corn syrup is indeed used by the beer manufacturers during the brewing process. And there's indications that high fructose corn syrups are also being used by the brewing manufacturers of beer during the brewing process. The question is, does any HFCS remain after the brewing process? So potentially, a beer could have alcohol, glucose, and fructose in it. And then lastly, we know that beer has purines in it. And this goes back to the protein component. So the beer uh, has essentially four distinct ways in which uh, macronutrients that are going to produce uric acid in the way that they are metabolized are in the beer. We have the ethanol, we potentially have fructose, we have the glucose, and we also have purines. Some of you may be sitting there going, well, Dr. Pete, 
I don't drink alcohol. So, you know, what, what is this going to do to your argument? And to that, I would say not much. And the reason not much is that because we could also imagine this guy going in and instead of ordering the beers, ordering the soda. And, and Dr. Lustig has written about the, the equivalency between soda and beer. And even though the, the so uh, in the soda, we have high fructose corn syrup or we have cane sugar. And those are going to produce a glucose load and a fructose load. In the beer, we have the alcohol and we have the glucose and potentially fructose in there. Plus, we have the protein component uh, pr providing the uric acid that way. So even if we eliminate the beer and this individual has a soda instead, the net effect is going to be the same because even though the alcohol uh, is processed differently than the fructose that's in the soda, the outcome is the same. We're still going to have a sudden rise, a sudden acute rise in uric acid at an intracellular level. And it doesn't really matter when, when you look at alcohol and fructose, which argument you make you're gonna end up in the, the same exact location. Okay, now let's move on to the pizza. So we have a large sausage pizza. Let's start with the crust. The crust is going to have a large glucose load in it. It can also have high fructose corn syrup in there. The sauce is gonna be similar because there's gonna be sugar in it and potentially high fructose corn syrup. So again, we're going to have glucose and fructose contribution from, from the sauce. And then we're gonna have the sausage and we also have the cheese, which is gonna provide a protein component, which when broken down can lead to uric acid. So we have several places in the pizza where we're going to get a glucose load and a fructose load and then a purine load from the protein. Now the breadsticks, mainly that's gonna be a glucose load, but again, in the dough that made the breadsticks, there can be high fructose corn syrup. And I, I don't know what they put on the outside of this thing either. So you could have both a glucose load and a fructose load from the breadsticks. And then last, we have a loaded salad. And the dressing that's on there, dre salad dressings are notorious uh, that are coming from you know processed sources for having sugar and also even the seed oils in them. So in terms of the salad dressing, whether it's cane sugar that was added to the dressing or whether it's high fructose corn syrup, again, we're gonna have both a glucose load and a fructose load. Now, what's important about thinking about in regard to this meal, the standard American meal, is the concept of excessive calories. Now, when I say excessive calories, I'm not talking here about the idea of calories in and calories out. I'm talking your everyday run-of-the-mill liver that's sitting there waiting, right? And then this individual sits down and they start eating. And they're going to eat this meal in a relatively short time frame. So you're going to have a large bolus, a large sampling of glucose, fructose, and potentially alcohol all arriving at the liver and at the kidneys at the same time. And this is what I'm referring to when I talk about excessive calories. As they are metabolized, we are going to have a sudden acute rise in uric acid in the intracellular environment that is then going to be shifted into the circulation. So we're going to have high uric acid levels in the cell and high uric acid levels in the circulation. So in this pizzeria dining experience, I consider this a hyperglycemic event. We have a large glucose load, 20% of which is going to land on the liver. The rest of the glucose is going to be distributed around the body to other organ systems like the pancreas, muscle tissue, brain, uh, kidneys, if I haven't already mentioned it, and also I'm going to mention it now, the chondrocytes that are in the, the cartilage. The glucose is going to enter the liver in a regulated fashion by a glucose transporter where it will be phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. There is a cellular mechanism that regulates the glucose carefully and maintains ATP concentrations. The, the glucose 
which is coming in in a high load will be in excess and the, the process for metabolizing the glucose to pyruvate, that pathway is going to be completely full and there are going to be three consequences. The first is, is that the glycolysis pathway, as I said, is going to be completely occupied. That means if we have a metabolic requirement coming in from another pathway in the cell, access to the glycolysis is going to be blocked because there's no room for anything incoming. Secondly, there's going to be a buildup of pyruvate waiting to get into the mitochondria because we have an excess of glucose. And lastly, as a result of the hyperglycemia, right, the high glucose load in the blood, we are going to have a high level of expression of insulin. And most everybody who's listening to this most likely already knows that that means we're, we're going to have an elevation of insulin resistance happening in, the, happening in the background of everything else that we are now going to talk about. Before we move on to fructose, I want to clarify something I said earlier about glucose. First, glucose will enter the liver cell in either a regulated or unregulated way, depending on the glucose receptor or transporter and the influence of insulin. Secondly, the first step of glycolysis is irreversible with the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate with the hydrolysis of ATP. Thirdly, remember that the fructose that is entering the liver is entering the liver at the same time as the glucose. And the excess of fructose that's coming into the liver may indeed influence the pool of glucose entering glycolysis and the pool of, of pyruvate waiting to get into the mitochondria. Now let's talk about the fructose. Approximately 60 to 70 percent of the fructose eaten in the meal is going to land on the liver. The other 30 to 40 percent of the fructose is going to land on the kidney. All of the respective fructose enters the liver and enters the kidneys. Specifically in the kidneys, the fructose is going to enter the proximal tubule cells. In this example, I'm going to talk about the fructose relative to the liver, but be advised that the reactions and the effects that we're talking about here with the fructose in the liver is the same in the proximal tubule of the kidney. As I said, all of the fructose that lands on the liver is going to be quantitatively transported into the liver, where it is going to be quantitatively phosphorylated by fructokinase using ATP. The ATP component of the hepatocyte of the liver cell is going to be severely depleted with a massive formation of AMP, which activates AMP deaminase. And the AMP deaminase in a number of steps is going to convert the AMP into uric acid. So as the fructose comes into the cell, this is the first place where we see a sudden acute rise in uric acid at the intracellular level. Additionally, the fructose 1-phosphate initiates de novo lipogenesis via the formation of glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which leads to intrahepato triglyceride synthesis and ultimately fatty liver. Lastly, the fructose 1-phosphate initiates the inflammatory cascade with the expression of junk 1. This is important to remember because junk 1 is a transcription factor and this particular protein is instrumental in our hypothesis of gout. Now remember, we are dealing with a situation here of excess calories. And what I mean by that, again, is that we have a maximum load of glucose that's coming into the liver cell. We have a maximum amount of fructose that's come into the liver cell and it's being processed. 
the excess of glucose causes the initiation of another pathway, which is called the polyol pathway. And in this case, what's going to happen is some of that glucose is going to be processed to sorbitol and then sorbitol to endogenous fructose. And this is going to be initiated by an enzyme called aldose reductase. And that conversion is now shown in this slide. The polyol pathway is initiated under three kinds of conditions and and oftentimes it'll be a combination of these conditions. The first is hyperglycemia, which is the situation uh, that we have here in this particular meal. The second way is if the process that's happening is under hypoxic conditions. Remember this constraint because later on we're going to move to a cartilaginous joint and the synovial fluid that is in cartilaginous joints is hypoxic. And thirdly, uh, uh, polyol is initiated under conditions which are hypertonic or high salt conditions. In the case that we're talking about right now, we have hyperglycemia, which is activating the polyol pathway and initiating the formation of endogenous fructose. So we're going to get an acute and sudden rise in uric acid because of the conversion of fructose to fructose 1-phosphate with a sudden rise in AMP and then the conversion of AMP by AMP deaminase and then a few steps to get to the formation of uric acid. Before moving on to the issue of alcohol, let's revisit the inflammation response due to fructose. The hyperglycemia and the fructose together induce the intracellular stress response mediated through methylglyoxal, which activates the mitogen activated protein kinase, MKK7, which also activates, you guessed it, junk one. So overall, fructose drives three results. The first is mitochondrial dysfunction due to the sharp acute rise in uric acid. Secondly, it activates the inflammational cascade. Primarily, the issue is junk one. And thirdly, we have the activation of de novo lipogenesis, which leads to fatty liver. On this next slide, I'd like to draw your attention now to the metabolism of the alcohol, of which 80% of the alcohol is going to land on the liver. The other 20% is going to be distributed around the body. On this slide, I'd like to draw your attention first to the right side of the slide, where we see a two-step reaction that takes the alcohol to acetate. So. In terms of the alcohol, it is going to have two main effects on the production of uric acid. The first effect, which I'm about to describe, involves a, a, a kidney excretion issue that causes the uric acid to be elevated in the system. The second step, or the second effect, will be a, a production effect. So the alcohol in its transition to acetate and then the acetate to acetyl-CoA, which I'll get into, is going to ca cause a sharp acute rise in uric acid right in the, in the mitochondria. So let's get started. Okay, firstly, I want to draw your eyes to the right side of the slide where I show the conversion of ethanol to acetate in two steps. The entry level enzyme is alcohol dehydrogenase, but most importantly I want to focus on, on the two molecules of NADH that are produced here. Remember we have the 80 percent of the ethanol is entering the liver in an unregulated way, so we have a hyperethanol situation. We have a large bolus of ethanol that's now entering this two-step pathway. So we have a large excess of NADH that's been produced. And you can consider the NADH to operate like molecular money. 
The other side of this is to remember that our glycolytic pathway is full and there is a pool of excess pyruvate that is waiting to get into the mitochondria. The, the, the effect of this is that the excess NADH is going to push the pyruvate into lactate or drive the pyruvate into lactate. And lactate is an organic acid that makes its way to the kidneys where it is going to be excreted into the urine. The problem is the lactate, as it's excreted into the urine, is competing with the uric acid that is circulating and blocks the uric acid from excretion. So the net result is that the uric acid is going to rise and it's rising because of an excretion issue. The acetate is converted to acetyl-CoA in a two-step process inside the mitochondria. And the two steps require the hydrolysis of ATP with the conversion to AMP. And then, you guessed it, we have the involvement, once again, of AMP deaminase, which in a series of steps results in the formation of uric acid. Only now the uric acid is being formed directly inside the mitochondria and we have disruption of the mitochondria's function. So this is the second place where alcohol in its processing uh, results in a sharp and sudden rise of acute uric acid. To summarize the alcohol, we pretty much have a double whammy because there are two effects one of which is an excretion issue, right? The lactate is blocking the uric acid from excretion, so the uric acid's gonna rise. The second is a production issue, where the acetate is converted into acetyl-CoA, and ATP is converted to AMP, and the AMP ends up uh, being converted into uric acid. So we have, again, an acute intracellular uh, increase in, in uric acid. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about protein. On this slide, I'm outlining the basic process where the, break, the breakdown of protein leads to the formation of uric acid. So the protein in our diet most of the time comes from cellular sources. And when we break down cellular sources, we're also gonna end up breaking down DNA and RNA, which is the origin of the purines. And then the purines, as descriptive here, are broken down into uric acid. Just remember that the, that the uric acid load that's being provided here is secondary to the acute rise of uric acid that we see due to the ethanol and to the, to the fructose. But still, this is gonna to contribute to the overall uric acid load on the system. The purpose of this slide now is to summarize the overall effects. Because remember, we're dealing with a, a tsunami, basically, of macronutrients that have descended on the liver that are causing these effects. That we have the glucose, we have the fructose, and we have the alcohol. So what are the net effects? We have oxidative stress because of the elevated uric acid uh, working directly to cause mitochondrial dysfunction. We have fatty liver going on because we have... The, the activation of de novo uh, lipogenesis. So we're forming triglycerides literally right in and uh, oil droplets right in the liver, which leads to fatty liver. We have insulin resistance because we have mitochondrial dysfunction. We have, and this is important to the hypothesis, we have initiation or activation of the inflammatory pathway with the activation of junk one. And then lastly, we have disruption of nitric oxide pathway, which leads to endothelial dysfunction, which down the road is, is associated with cardiovascular disease. So at this point in the talk, we need to take a brief segue because the elephant in the room, or one of the elephants in the room, has to do with hyperuricemia. There are many people, millions of people, walking around out there with hyperuricemia. So how, how do we end up in, in that condition? What's going on with this? All right, so stepping back from this and thinking about chronic disease, and, and like this was true in my case, you have 
literal decades of eating this way. And uh, the, as the dysfunction builds up, one of, of the possibilities that's driving the hyperuricemia is a kidney defect that happens because of the effect of, of intracellular uric acid in the proximal tubes of the glomerulus in the kidney with disruption of proximal tubule function. The net result is a defect in the ability of the kidney to excrete uric acid. And as a result, fasting uric acid uh, tends to rise in these individuals. This seems to be the case for me. So let's review at this point the gout hypothesis. Number one, we, need, we needed to know how we get the uric acid and we've sorted that out. We know how the uric acid is caused to have an acute rise within the cell. The second thing is, how do we get the inflammational cascade with the expression of junk one? And we've sorted that out. So where does that leave us? It leaves us trying to understand how the NLRP3 inflammasome is formed. That's question number one. And number two, how do we get from the liver and the kidney actually into a joint where the gout flare actually happens? And now we are going to turn the story to the joint. So now we turn our sights on the chondrocyte. A chondrocyte is a biological cell which is found in cartilage whose job it is to provide nutrients and the specialized proteins that are needed uh, in a particular joint. The chondrocytes are bathed in a fluid called synovial fluid and I want to draw your attention first to the right side of the slide because the first question we got to answer is can the solutes or the substances that are circulating in our uh, system diffuse into the synovial fluid where the chondrocytes exist? And the answer is yes. On the right side of the slide, I have listed glucose, fructose, and uric acid. Because of all the solutes that are circulating, these are, are the top three that we need to know can get to the chondrocytes. And we, we find glucose and fructose and uric acid in concentrations that are comparable to that found in serum and in plasma. We also know that the chondrocyte can transport fructose into the cell. It also can transport glucose. It has all of the necessary transporters that are required for fructose and glucose transport. Additionally, the chondrocyte can also transport uric acid either out of the chondrocyte or into the chondrocyte. This is important because in a second we're going to have to talk about where the uric acid is, right? We need it in the joint where it can crystallize and there will be two sources of the uric acid either arriving there from the circulatory system which we know is a, is a high probability or secondly it can also be produced directly in the chondrocyte and then transport it out into the synovial fluid. We also want to ask the question about junk one and junk one indeed is activated and produced inside the chondrocyte. So fructose indeed can be transported into the chondrocyte where it's going to be metabolized as I've described for the liver and for, and for the, the kidney. So we're, we have the capabilities to have acute sudden rises in, in uric acid in the chondrocyte. We also can functionally produce junk one. So we have the inflammatory cascade there. Additionally, the chondrocyte is bathed in synovial fluid, which is hypoxic. And we have a situation because of the hyperglycemia and therefore hyperglycemia in the synovial fluid, whereby in the chondrocyte, we also have high levels of glucose and the hyperglycemia and the fact that the chondrocyte specializes in glycolysis and the hypoxic environment means that we have the activation of the polyol pathway in the chondrocyte with endogenous production of fructose. 
So we have fructose metabolism going on in the chondrocyte producing a sudden acute rise in uric acid within the chondrocyte activating the inflammatory cascade with the expression of junk one. So how do we get to the NLRP3 inflammasome? Because now we have everything that we need in the joint. In this 2017 paper by Song et al, they show unequivocally that junk one is a requirement for the initiation and assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So now we have all three things that we need for a gout flare in the joint. We have the production of uric acid or the arrival of uric acid via the circulatory system. We have the activation of the inflammatory cascade with the expression of junk one. And we have the potential formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome on site because junk one is required to initiate the assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome. And in addition to that, we also have the expression of IL-1 beta, which is a cytokine that is capable of attracting the innate immune system. Let's turn to the innate immune system now. This slide nicely summarizes the situation that we now have in the cartilaginous joint. We have the chondrocyte, which can produce uric acid on its own. Additionally, it expresses junk one, and the NLRP3 inflammasome can be assembled on the urate crystals. We also have the presence of the innate immune system with resident cells that include the macrophage, the neutrophils, and the monocyte. All three of those cell types produce junk one. Additionally, they can metabolize the glucose and the fructose, as I've already explained for these other cell types. The innate immune system is also expressing IL-1-beta. So we have the uh, precise conditions that we need for a gout flare. We have all of the pieces, the uric acid in the joint. We have uh, junk one that is uh, able to initiate the assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome, bam, gout flare. So what are the main goals of a gout remission plan? First and foremost, we need to eliminate what I hope is obvious to you, which is the alcohol and fructose containing substances. That would be sugar, high fructose corn syrup, agave syrups, and processed food. The alcohol and the fructose have got to go. Secondly, we want an eating plan that is going to lower systemic inflammation and therefore lower the expression of junk one. We need to lower junk one because we want to inhibit the formation of the NLR P3 inflammasome. So we need to block the NLR uh, P3 inflammasome. And that brings me to the ketogenic diet because the ketogenic diet is an elimination diet and we also cut into the carbs. And when we cut into the carbs and lower the insulin expression, the individual on that particular lifestyle is going to be producing ketones. And the ketone of interest here is beta-hydroxybutyrate, which recently was shown to inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. So what does an outline for a gout remission plan that involves the ketogenic diet look like. Firstly, they need the supervision of a doctor. And the reason for this is because when we go on to the ketogenic diet and we lower the carbs, we also are lowering the insulin expression. The result is, is that when we shift into the fat burning mode, we will pr be producing these small molecules called ketones. And these small molecules called ketones are organic acids that make their way to the kidneys where they will be excreted into the urine. And like the story behind lactate, when the, the ketones are excreted into the urine, they're gonna block the excretion of the uric acid. And so gout sufferers will see 
their uric acid spike when they shift onto the ketogenic diet. And during that spike, they are vulnerable to a gout attack. And therefore, they need to make sure they're talking to their doctor about this important transition and have access to anti-inflammatory drugs so they can push through the gout flare if it happens and then get keto adapted, which usually takes a couple of months, over which they should eventually see the uric acid come back down. Secondly, and as I've already stated, the alcohol and the fructose containing substances need to be eliminated, but we are also going to cut in to the total carbs that, that these individuals are eating on a daily basis. The keto plan that I recommend is 5% carbohydrates, 20% protein, and 75% healthy fats. Fourth, I highly recommend monitoring uric acid using a handheld meter. I recommend monitoring not only fasting uric acid, but also uric acid before and after meals and at other random times of the day, including before and after exercise. The main reason for monitoring uric acid is to get a healthy understanding of what your uric acid looks like over, as best you can, a 24-hour period. The last part of the plan is to consider uric acid lowering drugs. I recommend waiting until you're fully keto adapted and you have a good understanding of where your fasting uric acid has settled at. Because after you come down off of that spike, for some of us, our fasting uric acid remains high. Other people, it shifts down into the middle of the reference range. In my case, my uric acid settled out at the high end of the reference range. So you have a personal decision to make. Do I take a uric acid lowering drug in order to bring my uric acid down into the middle of the reference range? I made the decision to go on allopurinol in order to put my uric acid between five and six mg per deciliter. The ketogenic diet is not a cure for gout. I think we need to talk about what remission means. Gout sufferers that choose to go down this road to gout remission need to understand that the symptoms can indeed return. How do they return? Because if a gout sufferer on the ketogenic diet is not careful about cheating, right? Going back to drinking alcohol or going back to, eat, to eating sugary foods or, or foods that have high fructose corn syrup in them, they can have another gout flare. One advantage, however, is that the gout flare that happens once you're keto adapted seems to be more mild in both the extent and the level of pain. During my gout flare in 2016, before I was ever on the ketogenic diet, the doctor asked me to rate the pain between one and 10, and the pain was 10 for me. Now, on the ketogenic diet being keto adapted, if I'm asked the same question, the level of, of pain is a one or a two. I believe anecdotally that gout sufferers on the ketogenic diet are most vulnerable to another gout flare when the uric acid is shifting from a low to a high value or from a high value to a low value. Truly putting gout in remission for good means that you have to eliminate alcohol and fructose from your diet. If you go back to eating alcohol or fructose, then in all likelihood, you're gonna have a gout flare. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching my presentation. And as I always say, keep the carbs low, down the road we go.